Good morning. It is a joy to be back in the house of the Lord today. I'm going to say this now because I keep forgetting before the offering. Um, there is an attendance sheet in your bulletin. Please do sign this up. And if it's the first week back or if you didn't receive a phone call during the quarantine, uh, put your phone number on there because that means I don't have <laughs> the right phone number for you. Uh, this is in case someone tests positive in the room and they let me know. Uh, we can let everyone else know so that they know. Um, we've been open a month. That hasn't happened yet. Fingers crossed that that continues. Uh, but that's just so for contact tracing purposes, it's really important that you get your name in. If you've already provided your phone number, you just need a name. <laughs> but uh, we need to make sure we have contact info for you. And the second thing is that there is in here on the back. Uh, a paragraph about the backpack program. Uh, we participate in the backpack program that is a uh, community-wide uh, back backpack supply. Uh, and this year, rather than having you go out and touch all the stuff and bring it back in and then have someone else touch all the stuff and put it in the backpack for someone else to touch all that stuff to finally give it to the kids, we're asking that you just go ahead and provide a monetary donation. Please write that out to the church. And then we collectively will have a monetary donation to the backpack program, and then um, they will go out and buy the stuff, and it reduces the amount of hands. Um, so that is uh, information for that is on the back. If you do write a check out to the church for this, be sure to somehow mark it this for the backpacks, because otherwise it's going to go into the general fund. <laughs> Because uh, we, we would have no way to tell the difference. So either have it in a different envelope that says, you know, that, or put it in the memo line, or both, um, something along those lines. Uh, that's the early announcements. We have a time for regular announcements later on, but those have to be done, and I want to give you time before the offering to, to make that happen. Would you greet one another in the peace and love of Jesus Christ by using your voice? We... Hello. Good morning, <laughs> Let us now prepare our hearts for worship with this beautiful music. Forgot it existed to put it back in. There's no other reason. There's no reason it didn't knew that it's just 
I forgot about it, and I, I thought about it this week. I'm like, oh, I should put that back in. So here, here it is. Let's join in the call to worship. Come all who are weary and find in your rest. The Lord is faithful to us. Do what you can. The Lord works miracles. Let us pray. Almighty God, throughout the generations, you have worked with the smallest and most normal of people. You have worked miracles with the work of mortals. Come and reside with us, O Holy Spirit. Multiply our efforts that we might take part in your work in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I invite you to listen and meditate on the words in the, in the insert for him a promise. Singing is discouraged. a flower, in the seed an apple tree, in cocoons a hidden promise, butterflies will soon be free. In the cold and snow of winter, there's a spring that waits to be unrevealed until its season, something God alone can see. There's a song in every silence, seeking word and melody. There's a dawn in every darkness, bringing hope to you and me. From the past will come the future, what it holds a mystery. I have in mind the Spring Hill Board of Education, which meets tomorrow, but I'm not going to say Spring Hill, I'm just going to say the Board of Education, so you can insert whichever one you want in your mind as you pray along with me. Uh, but there are a lot of decisions that are being made right now, and there are no correct decisions. It's a whole bunch of wrong decisions with a whole list of cons and not much pros, and you have to make one of them. And every parent is making that choice, every student who's of a um, you know, age old enough is making that choice. Every teacher is making that choice. I have a friend who's a teacher whose husband is immunocompromised due to a transplant. She's having to decide, do I keep my family's health insurance or do I try and protect my husband from this? There's no right decisions. Um, so we will pray for guidance. We will pray for peace. We will pray for comfort. <laughs> All of these things as, as people are going through uh, these decisions. So now I ask, are there any other prayer requests that you all have? Can you pray for the call? I did not get an update. I don't know an update on Charles Jenkins. Um, we had asked for prayer last week. Dad did for Ernie. 
number of GMB clothing and he has to wear it on the Or any of the, the owner of B&B clothing uh, passed away this week. Cancer. Let us go to God. Lord God, we ask your blessings upon this place, upon this city. This has been a week of turmoil, a week of anxiety for so many, a week of just not knowing what was happening, what was going to happen. Lord God, there are many who are facing impossible decisions. We pray your blessings upon the Board of Education, upon every parent, every teacher, every staff member, every student who's making a decision these next few weeks for what to do for this coming year. We pray for your guidance, for your wisdom, for your comfort, for your peace upon all those who are making these decisions. You know far more than us what the future holds. Help us to be wise. Lord God, each of us bring things that are personal to us on our own hearts, and some of those have been raised. We lift up to you, Brittany, and her young child, and, and ask for your protection upon them as they face this next few uncertain months. We pray for Ernie, for his family, for all of his friends, that you would accept him into heaven with open arms, that you would comfort those who grieve who are left behind. And we continue to pray for Cole. We ask your blessings upon him in his situation. Lord God, we come to you today to worship. We come to you today with all of these things weighing down upon our hearts and we lift them up and ask that you would bless our world, that you would help us whatever way we can, to be your shining light, to be your, your love in breaking upon the darkness. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name as we remember the prayer he taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. As we those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. I invite children to come forward and sit on the other end of the bench from him. So I was going to pick on Caleb uh, here, but, uh, but I think that I do this too, so I'm just going to use me. You ever gone into a store, and you, you're looking on the shelves, you're looking in the window, and you see something, and you just need that thing? Need it? Like, you're, you're going to die if you don't have that thing, whatever it is? <laughs> exactly. I, I have the same problem, Johnny. For me, I, I sometimes will, will make the mistake of going into the electronic section at Walmart. I'll go through the games, even the games and the systems I don't own, so I literally can't play them, but I'm going through the games and I'm like, oh, I need that game. <laughs> and then it dominates my mind, right? I go home and I try and forget about it, but it's there and it's, it's dominating. Maybe you know that feeling. Maybe you don't. If you don't, consider that a blessing. <laughs> but Jesus says heaven is like that. Jesus says heaven is like that, that, that you can see heaven, and when you get a glimpse of heaven, you just can't forget about it. It dominates your mind. And, 
and you need it so badly, you just go and you give up everything else to go and get heaven. Jesus says that's what heaven is like for us. And did you know that we as Christians can make heaven open a little bit more, that make heaven more visible on earth so more people can see heaven and get that glimpse through every kind and loving action that we do to others. This is what we're called to do. We're called not only to long for the kingdom, to long for Jesus to come into our lives, but also to love and show kindness to others so that others may see that glimpse and long for it themselves. So can you do that this week? Can you be kind and loving to others and, and look out for heaven? All right, let's pray. Lord God, we give you thanks that you, are, you provide us these little windows into your beautiful, wonderful place. We ask your blessings upon this world, and we ask that you would help us to be kind and loving to other people, that we might show them what you have shown us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. today four parables of Jesus. Well, really, we have two groups of two parables, right? We have the parable of the mustard seed and of the yeast, and then we skipped a few verses, and then we had the parable of the treasure in the field and the parable of the pearl. And it may seem like they don't have that much in common, but I think they do. Each of these have their own lesson to teach us. Each of these evoked their own images in my mind of, of things in our world that might be of a similar idea, and yet they also can be combined together to give us a glimpse as to what the kingdom of heaven is like and what the kingdom of heaven is doing in our world. And so I want today to go through each of these parables to explain a little bit about them, the lesson that they have to teach us, maybe try and translate them into a 2020 idea, a more modern concept, and then combine them together to get a glimpse of what the kingdom of heaven is like, according to Jesus in the 13th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. So first we see the parable of the mustard seed. And this is not the parable of the mustard seed you're probably thinking of when I say those words. But the parable of the mustard seed, where Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven is like a small seed, a mustard seed, the smallest of seeds, it gets planted in a field, and it grows into the largest of bushes, Jesus says, and so that the, the birds of the air can... can flock to its branches and receive comfort and blessings. That small thing, something small, a mustard seed or planting a seed grows into something much larger through the work of God. Primarily, Jesus says, for the purpose of blessing others. I want you to notice that. Jesus does not say that the mustard seed grows into the largest of bushes for the purpose of producing as much mustard as possible. But rather, for the purpose of blessing the birds of the air. The work of Jesus is for the blessing of other people. Now it's worth noting, and I have to point this out, that it's a little bit ironic what Jesus is doing here. That Jesus is saying something a little bit more than you might think at first viewing. Because a mustard bush is not majestic. It is not big. It is small. It is probably not enough to provide enough shelter for the birds of the air. 
Rather, what I think Jesus is doing is he's alluding to a passage from Ezekiel, where Ezekiel compares the kingdom of heaven to the cedars of Lebanon. The cedars of Lebanon were the tallest, most majestic trees the old world knew. And Ezekiel was saying the kingdom of heaven is like that, and that tree absolutely can provide shelter for the birds of the air, and Ezekiel even says so. It's what I think Jesus is saying is, look, the kingdom of heaven does not value things the way you value things. And to the kingdom of heaven, this small mustard bush is as important as the giant cedars of Lebanon. And through God's work, this small bush can provide just as much blessing to other people as the giant cedars of Lebanon, or in this case, the birds of the air. But also, Jesus used mustard. Mustard was a curse word to the farmers of that area. I don't know what the equivalent would be here in Kansas, but I do know, or for a farmer, but I do know what the equivalent is for me living in suburbia of the United States. The kingdom of heaven is like a dandelion that gets into your field. No matter how much you try and eradicate it, it grows and it multiplies and it takes over the field. And that was what mustard did back then. It was not something you planted. Even though Jesus says the farmer planted, it was not something you planted because it would take over the whole field. It would ruin the crop. And mustard was not extremely valuable. It was you know, far more valuable to be growing things like olives or grapes or whatever else you wanted to grow or wheat. And so mustard comes in and invades. And that's what Jesus is saying here as well, I think. The kingdom of heaven is an invader. It is coming into our world from outside, and even though you may want to stop it, you can't. It will get through, and it will transform. That leads us into the parable of the yeast. We're told that a woman comes and places, in other translations it says, hides yeast inside a rather large amount of wheat, and, and the yeast permeates, we're told, the entire wheat. This is compared to the kingdom of heaven, that a small thing is implanted into a much larger thing, and once it gets in there, it starts to expand and it transforms the entirety of the thing that it got placed into into something that is completely unrecognizable and in a way that cannot be undone. Once wheat is leavened, there's no making it unleavened again. The kingdom of heaven is like this. Now, in that day, an unleavened loaf of bread would actually have been slightly more valuable than a leavened loaf, at least a leavened pile of wheat. Because, although we like our bread leavened, I don't know if you've gone to the grocery store recently, a leavened loaf of bread takes up a lot more room than a pack of tortillas. And that's the case back then as well, except they didn't have room. Room was a commodity in and of itself. So what you would do is you would take only what you needed to cook, and you would leaven that, and then you would cook it. Right? You would only take small amounts. And what this woman does is she provides yeast for enough wheat to make a hundred loaves of bread at least. That's not what you would do. You would only take the small ones. And so what I think Jesus is saying is that you know the kingdom of heaven is going to get into places you don't want it to get into. And once it does, it's going to transform it into something else. In this case, it will transform your world into the kingdom. I'm an amateur author, and so I was reminded of a writing and concept here. This is the concept that a small action can have a ripple effect on down the line. And in science fiction, particularly in time travel science fiction, we call this the butterfly effect. You might recognize this from uh, a movie uh, with the same title a few years ago. And this is the idea that if a butterfly flaps its wings in Spring Hill, Kansas, it can cause a tornado in Berlin. Right? The butterfly flaps its wings, and that transfers the, the air current just changed a little bit, and that changed the air current behind it, and changed the air current behind it, and it begins to multiply to the point that by the time it gets to the other side of the world, it can be this torrential, powerful wind. This is the idea, this is the concept behind the butterfly effect. And science fiction is usually for time travelers, and it's the idea that if you go back in time, and you change even a small thing, it can have this ripple effect throughout time so that you know, in 200 years, time will be unrecognizable to what it was before because you went back and you changed this one small thing. Maybe you met the wrong person at the wrong time. Maybe you moved a, piece of, uh, moved a pencil from one side of a desk to the other side of a desk. Whatever it was, this one small action has this massive ripple effect throughout time. This is, think um, Back to the Future. 
right? Did this one uh, probably the best way. Marty McFly goes back, he meets his mother, and all of a sudden he stops existing. And he's got to, you've got to fix that. Otherwise, you know, time has changed because he had this one chance encounter. This is the default in time travel. It is the only trope I know that if you don't use it in your novel, you have to explicitly state, this doesn't apply here, otherwise, and sometimes even if you do, there's going to be some commenter that says, there's a plot hole here. It's the default, it's the assumed, we take it for granted. I was reminded of that kind of an idea with the parable of the yeast. Something small permeating into something large, becoming much larger than it was. Next, Jesus brings us to a field. He says someone was walking out in the field and they find a treasure and they, they are so excited at this treasure that they bury the treasure in the field. They go out, they sell everything they own and they buy the whole field. I thought this treasure was so valuable that it made the whole field valuable. And I want to point that out continually. The whole field. They didn't just bury the treasure in a corner and then try and buy the corner of the field. No, they buried the treasure where they found it. They were so excited that they went on about the whole field. Even the part where it's a little bit too low and the water never really dries out and you can't plant anything. Even the hill where the tractor can't quite get the right angle and you can't plow that hill. The whole field was made valuable by this one treasure. And that is what Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like here. I was reminded of a potluck. You ever go to a potluck, and there's that one dish, you know the one dish I'm talking about, right? That one dish, go downstairs, and there's Mrs. Tilton's meatballs, there they are. And you run out, you sell all your possessions, you buy the entire potluck spread, because you want to have every single one of Mrs. Tilton's meatballs. The kingdom of heaven is like Mrs. Tilton's meatballs. You notice I didn't pick any of your dishes. You're not allowed to go back to my previous charge and tell them that I like Mrs. Tilton's meatballs and buy everything else, although they probably agree with me. Finally, we've made it to the fourth parable. The parable of the precious gem, which I don't think needs translating into 2020. I think this one works just fine. The merchant is out shopping. He's going window shopping down the, down the uh, mall, and he sees a gem. He sees a diamond that is so beautiful. He just can't stand it, and he, he has to have it. So he goes and he sells everything he has, and he buys this one gem so that he can hold on to this thing that he's found, this beautiful, beautiful thing that he's found. Now together, these four parables may not seem like they're saying the thing, same thing, but they're all talking about the kingdom of heaven, and they all teach us something else about the kingdom of heaven. Like that story of the, of the people that blindfolded in a room with an elephant, and each one of them is describing something else about the kingdom of heaven, the elephant in this case. And so let's take a look at what they combine to tell us. The kingdom of heaven is something small, but also something powerful. It exists in our world, and in spite of being small, it is extremely valuable, and it is valuable enough to overshadow everything around it. And once you experience the kingdom, Nothing else will matter. Everything else will be transformed. The kingdom of heaven is active in our world and it has the ability to transform our world by its very presence. It has the ability to make the world around it more desirable. The kingdom of heaven is a blessing to others. It makes the world more valuable. It makes the world more worth living in. And though it looks small at the moment, the kingdom can grow to provide blessings. For our community. One thing that's struck me over the years, for years now, is the reality that we do accept the butterfly effect as fact, as readers, as authors, to the point that if you don't use it in your story, like Avengers Endgame didn't use it in their story, you have to explicitly state. We're not using it. In fact, Avengers Endgame stated it six different times throughout the movie. That this doesn't apply. They wanted to beat it into the, the uh, uh, audience's head that we're not using this. And there were still commenters. It's the default. We assume it to be true that if you go back in time and you change anything, even a small thing, that it will have a ripple effect and it will direct, dramatically change the future. But then we go out into our lives and we act like we can't make a difference. We go out into our lives and we act like we can't do anything. 
that we're powerless. We're just a small little group of people in rulish America. You see how that doesn't compute. We may be small, but we can have a massive impact on our world. Anything that we do can be mighty if we trust God to make it happen. So I'm telling you today, church, to go out into your community, to go out into your world and act. For your actions might be the butterfly that flaps its wings. Your action might make our church the meatballs of the world's potluck. Go out into the world and do something small. Now let us give thanks to God. Thanksgiving to the God who does work in miracles. In the form of our tithes and our offerings. accept this offering to give to you and that you would, would bless other people with it. That you would go out into the world through us in the form of this offering and in the actions that we offer to you this upcoming week. We pray this in your holy name, Lord. Amen. Amen. I don't have any further announcements from what was earlier. Do you all have any announcements? And I would invite you to uh, sit if you need to, but to listen to this music and through this music prepare your hearts to enter out into the world. place to do small things in our world, I would ask that God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit go with you to guide, protect, comfort, encourage, and uplift you. And may you go, and may God give you peace. Amen. <laughs>